The reason why I picked this specific paper for presentation is not only because it is now a revised and resubmit in research policy, but also because it was conceived on a previous summer school where I was faculty. So I was faculty in 2016. One of the faculty members was showing off the textual analysis tools that he was using for his research. So his name was Marian Morshoro, and he is, I think, now in Berkeley or somewhere. Point being, he presented the toolbox and I said, here is an awesome thing we can do with that. We can, we can use that to analyze papers of people in journals. And he said, that's very exciting, but I don't want to. I was like, fine, I'm going to do it myself. And I did it myself and now it uh, seems to be working more or less. And uh, I hope your participation in Russia uh, summer school will be at least as fruitful as it was for me, at least the last time I was there. Right, so I didn't want it to go too deep into the paper itself because it's like the field of uh, studying um, papers in economics, that's, that's what I'm doing, is not terribly rewarding. Um, if you imagine the average reader of the paper about publications. It's usually a person who was doing publications and uh, you kind of have your own opinion about everything, right? So when you see a paper that tells you something about the publications, you can, you have two natural responses, two knee jerk responses. One is it's obvious, right? And the second one is it's obviously wrong, right? So. Like if an academic professional, right, sees a paper about uh, venture capitalism, right, this person can never participate in a single venture thing. But that's the reason why that person starts paying attention and reading the paper. Uh, it's not the case for education, it's not the case for economics of publications. Like, don't take it as an advertising of research in economics of publication. Economics of publication is surprisingly hard. Take it as advertising in using textual analysis in your uh, papers. And I'm going to spend most of the time talking about textual analysis. And then I'll show you how I use textual analysis in my stuff. Sound good? I'm looking at the chat and everybody says hello. And hello to everybody. Yeah, it's right. good. <laughs> Right. Uh, I am going to check the chat from time to time. If I don't reply to you immediately, that means I haven't seen your question yet. So I'll, I, that's just, it takes too much space on my screen. Uh, if you raise I your hand, I will be able to see. I will try to follow chat and, uh, and let you know if I see something. That on. If Lena waves the hand, I'll, I'll like, don't, don't be afraid of interrupting me. I have too many thoughts. I'll, if I lose mine, I'll, I'll pick another one and go ahead with that. So my paper that is going to be the end of that uh, asked a different question compared to what other pe papers were asking. So the way how publishing process in economics works is that you have a bunch of authors and a bunch of authors are writing a bunch of papers and they submit them to the journal and there is an editor he looks at the paper, he thinks, okay, this guy wants to publish. Should I publish him? Should I not publish him? Right? And then some papers get published, some papers don't get published, authors resubmit. Right? So, I mean, the, the important part is that authors know that the editors will evaluate their papers. All right? And there is a number of papers that were studying things like uh, who gets published. Right, so for instance, if your advisor is the editor of the journal, are you more likely to get published? And yes. Is, if your colleague is the editor of the journal, are you more likely to pub get published there? Yes, right? So this kind of stuff like network analysis, like 10 years ago, it was very popular to study networks of things and networks of researchers was quite popular in there. There was an, excellent paper in quarterly uh, journal of economics, which was studying the superstar. So they had about 120 uh, superstars in different fields who died. And they looked at friends of superstars, 
okay? And turns out that if you were a friend of superstar and the superstar died, your productivity falls down by like 5%. I mean, not a lot, but still big enough to, you know, make a big difference for many of us. So I guess my point is people were studying things like if you get a Nobel Prize, are you more likely to be published? Yes. If you get a fellowship of Econometric Society, you're more likely to get published. Yes. Right. Um, there was the, a significant quantity of research about who is getting published. So what we bring with our paper is what is getting published. And um, think about this question like, like that. So uh, imagine you are right now an editor of a journal, right? And you get a paper about COVID. Are you likely to publish this paper? Who knows, right? From one perspective, maybe it will have a lot of readership. Maybe other papers who are reading, you know, other papers will cite the paper that you're gonna publish and you will have more citations in your journal. Sure, right? On the other hand, you know that the data is pretty raw. You are not having enough normal frameworks to study. So you don't really, you know, you don't, you don't want to make a half-baked paper. It's better to wait for 10 years and then publish a good study as opposed to quickly written up ambulance chasing kind of a paper now, right? So do you want to publish a paper on COVID? Who knows, right? And now think about it differently. So in July, there will be new editors of American Economic Review. Right, July, I think they, they, they start. Um, maybe one of them is going to be an epidemiologist. I don't know. I'm not participating in that decision. Maybe there is a new editor who is an epidemiologist coming into AR. And you have a paper about epidemiology. There's like 90% of the profession now has a paper about epidemiology. Would you submit that paper to AR where there's now an epidemiological editor? Unclear, right? On the one side, it is more likely to get to the person who understands the point that you're making, to understand the material that you're studying. Awesome, all right? They will understand what you're writing, they will understand the importance of that, they will maybe be more likely to publish that than if your paper got to some macro person, okay? On the other hand, if that understanding person got your paper, right, maybe, he understands the true value of that and he will be like, uh, I shouldn't publish too many papers about epidemiology. It's better for me to wait for some other people who have better papers and, and be more demanding to the papers that I personally like because I understand it. But because I will get complaints about being a favoritist or something, I'm gonna postpone it. There is so much stuff going on in there, right? what gets published, right? We decided to get a crack on that, all right? So, is there a selection of papers based on topics? And we are gonna study that looking at the appointment of editors. So there is an American Economic Review. Every July, there is three new editors, right? Sometimes two, sometimes four, but, you know, more or less consistently you get new editors. The news in that is that there is a new editor who is specializing in that specific thing. So the profession learns AR now has a paper who knows very well a specific field. Um, do you get a bias towards this editor specific topics? Do you get a negative bias towards this editor specific topic? Let's find out. To study that, we need to know who is working on what. We need to quantify the content loading of papers in journals. And I am going to go a little bit into what can we do. We are not the first ones to work on textual analysis. There is plenty of literature that works on textual analysis. In particular, this one, Genskov, Tellin, Kelly, and Teddy, provides you a summary in Journal of Economic Literature of all the kind of things you can do with textual analysis. Uh, if you want to start 
doing something about textual analysis, I advise you to start from that. Uh, but they were not the first, obviously, if you have a review, there's probably some other papers that are getting reviewed to that review. And there are some papers before that, and there are some papers after that, and I am going to show you what are they doing there. Right, so the more or less the first one loud enough, right, was the Journal of Finance paper from Antwiler and Frank, uh, who actually looked at the forums of Yahoo Finance. So they've got messages from Yahoo Finance, and this is how it looks like. So uh, the company is called Etis, the message number is that, this is the author, this is the date, and there is a text, okay? And then there is another message from Yahoo forums about IBM, it's a different person, and it's a different message, all right? So what they were looking at was, does it make sense to read those? Maybe it's just noise, right? Can we make sense from that noise? Well, we are not going to read them all, right, obviously. This was actually 2004. So what they were working on is uh, 2000, the data from 2000. There was not a lot of internet activity in these days. There is much more now. So they're looking at that and they're saying, okay, uh, do you know how the spam filter works? So the spam filter looks at the message and thinks, what is the probability that this message is the spam message? I am going to count words in my spam messages and in my non-spam messages. I'll have a big database of spam messages and non-spam messages. And I'm going to look at this new message and I'm going to think about the probability that this new message is the spam message, okay? So what happens is that, uh, yeah, let's do that. So let's say we look at the text like uh, Prince, right? Somebody writes you a message that includes the word Prince, right? And you're calculating probability of spam conditional on seeing the word prints, right? So you look at how frequently the word prints appears in the normal messages and how frequently does it appear in the spam messages and there's plenty of messages from foreign princes wanting to send you money from all kinds of foreign bank accounts. Most of them are lies, okay? Don't, don't send them any information about you like most of the princes who are, want to send you money are not gonna send you any money. But if there is a lot of spam messages with the word prince and not a lot of spam messages, but not a lot of non-spam messages with the word prince, you will get that higher, okay? So that's how naive Bayesian classificator works. It looks at the distribution of words in one group, in another group, and it calculates the probability that you belong into one of these two groups. Right, so what do they get in there? So they take, a, that's, that's their updating thing. Uh, bop, 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 bop. Right, so they took about uh, a thousand messages and they broke the thousand messages into uh, three groups, buy, hold, and sell by hand. And then they took all other messages, a million, right? And they took the algorithm that I just described, updating the probability that your, you know, message is the buy kind of message or message is the sell kind of message, okay? And they classified all these new million, Five, five hundred fifty-eight thousand six hundred twenty-one messages. They classified those into buy, hold, and sell. And they found that you know the proportion 
is pretty much the same. They don't provide the confidence interval. There is a bit less sell messages, a bit more hold messages, but yeah, what you're gonna do about it. And they've got this algorithm and they started trading. So they've got uh, stocks and they see a new message and they imaginarily make a transaction and they see what's the value of the portfolio at the end of the day. And the portfolio is pretty profitable. I'm not sure if, so that's the messages in thousands per day. There's a turnover, activity, there's, yeah. Um, stock index performance. And this is two stock indexes. This is what's going on. Right. I guess my point is there has got to be a number somewhere where it says that it's profitable and I, I lost it for good. Right, point being, reading newspapers, even stupidly with a Bayesian updating mechanism, like I described, is already earns you a little bit of money. And arguably reading it with brains might help you more, or if you're using a more sophisticated textual analysis, it might help you more. So this is 2004. Since then, science stepped forward. This is no longer would be publishable in the Journal of Finance in these years. Um, there was a dissertation that I know, a master dissertation in a new economic school that was looking at Twitter instead of the Yahoo. And in the Twitter, the author was looking for counts of smiley faces and frowny faces, okay? She was limiting the span into say, United States tweets and uh, the nice thing about the United States is that they're not using, you know, this kind of smile, they're only using this kind of smile. Um, I mean, when she wrote that, she got her master dissertation, right? And she took it into a, you know, the PhD group and she became a PhD student and she was like, well, do you think it's publishable? And they were like, no, two years ago, yes. Now, no longer. Nice thing about the smiles is that you don't need to translate them. So when you classify words, right, there might be different meaning, different meaning depending upon what was before, different meaning upon what was. There is very clear meaning in what you are talking about when you do that. Right. So nice thing is that she didn't need it to translate that, but not so nice thing was that the train has gone already. So yeah. Um, so this was the Bayesian classifier and I'm going to clear all my drawings. Everybody good so far? I just, uh, I'm not yet customized to eerie silence. <laughs> in the seminars, this, this sort of eerie silence is usually meaning that people are probably asleep. Uh, you're with me? Yes? No? Yeah. Please react somehow. I could say that, yes, it's fine, but I'm not the <laughs> prime Okay, okay. I see one. I see one with me. Yeah. All right. I see two. I see Shujat. Shujat? Yes, good. Yeah, all, good. Good. all good, all good. Good stuff. Sure, right. I'm here yeah. listening to you. Good, good. Uh, I'm going to the second paper. So the second paper was also in finance. Obviously, everybody was very happy that you can get free data and get money out of that. So finance people started doing all kinds of textual analysis. And this one was built not so much on the forums, which, you know, might be, there might be some filtering about who gets that and who doesn't get that. Uh, that was a study of uh, Wall Street Journal column. So everybody gets Wall Street, like if, even if they don't trade, there's easy ways of getting Wall Street Journal. I think it was even free to read it at that time. So. Uh, there was a column on Wall Street Journal and 
he was looking at the pessimism in the column in the Wall Street Journal. So he wanted to get a daily pessimism. And how did he do that? Well, he went to psychology people. Well, obviously he speaks about the market pessimism and market sentiment and stuff. And he went to psychologists and turned out that psychologists already have something called the general inquirer. So what's the general inquirer? So the general inquirer is a program that allows you to, uh, uh, no, um, to classify the words that you are getting, right? So there are positive words and there are negative words and there are pleasure words and there are pain words and there are, you know, virtue words, understand the understated, overstated words. So econ, right? I mean, all kinds of words. So he found negative words and I, I, I think the, there is a pessimism, let me, let me. Yes. Yeah, I think it was just, he just took the negative words and used that as a pessimism. So, and then he calculated the amount of pessimistic words in this column and he got a graph like, uh, pa, 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 pa. He had a graph about that. Is it Tetlock? Yeah, it's Tetlock. No. Uh. Pop, 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 pop. Yes, Suja. Well, in this paper, Professor, you are um, talking and mentioning the stock market, and mostly perception is that stock market has something, you know, some influence from the speculations. Speculations from the market, speculations coming from the government side, news coming, sure. statements come statements coming from the government side. Sure. So how, how these speculations can be analyzed through the, uh, this technique? I don't think he was analyzing speculations. I think he wanted to come up with a way of making speculations, right? So you wake up, you get your Wall Street Journal, you count the words, you're like, okay, I should probably sell my index, right? Um, and uh, I mean, right now in London, I am sure there are people who are like keeping track of Twitter in the real life, in, in the real time, and trying to make a transaction after, say, Trump publishes a new tweet. So immediately they, they want to make, want to, want to speculate faster than everybody else. Uh, I don't think like in the available stock market data, even on the tick data, you will be able to see which one is the speculation and which one is not. Right? Okay. Because you wouldn't be able to see who made the transaction unless you are like one of the market makers and you don't, as a market maker, you don't want to tell people <laughs> which right. one is the speculation, which one is Exactly. Not. Right. Thank you. Right. So yeah, so this textual analysis is even simpler. It's just taking the text, counting words, checking, like you have the library that psychologists told you that's a negative word, right? And that works. From that, you can make money, right? So, so finance people were so happy. They were reading like the SEC statements, if it's the, the stock, uh, stock, stock Exchange Committee in the United States. They were reading the uh, CEO um, calls when there is like a board of, a board of directors and they have the call and the CEO is telling the board of directors how well did the company. And they were analyzing words that the CEO was using. So like finance people were so happy with this textual analysis. There were like thousands of, of, of papers about that. But these two were like the big ones that started all, the, all, all their analysis. So the next one I wanted to cover is Baker Bloom Davis, uh, QGE. And I think it was under development for like 10 years or something. So I, I think uh, Nicholas Bloom had it as a job market paper even or something. So like for a long time. What do they do in there? So what do they do in there is they do a similar thing to what uh, Tetlock was doing. And what they do in there is they calculate uh, uncertainty. Are you actually seeing the paper or are you seeing something else? I, I cannot check this way. You should, you should be seeing the paper. Yes. Yes. Paper okay. is visible. 
so yeah, they count articles in 10 newspapers from January 1995 to 2010 uh, with words, one, they need to have uncertainty or uncertain. Number two, they need economic or economy. And number three, they need Congress, deficit, Federal Reserve legislation, regulation, or White House. So they need uncertainty, economic, White House. Okay. And they call this count of articles in these newspapers, they call it the economic policy uncertainty. And they build a index in time and uh, these guys definitely have the picture. This should be here, All right? So that nothing, nothing, nothing. Black Monday, zoop, All right? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Gulf War, zoop. Nothing. Not LTCM, zoop. So there are some things that are easy to explain with fundamentals. That are easy to explain with, uh, uh, you know, that that sunny summer or not having a pandemic, right? But these immediate jumps such as uh, the, the LTCM or the Lehman Brothers. I, I, yeah, here it is, the Lehman Brothers. If you look at financial data, you see that there are big outliers and these policy uncertainty index turned out to be very good at predicting these outliers. So the whole paper is about how you know useful is that in all kinds of regressions. So you can you don't have to do it about the economics. You can do it about healthcare. So here you can see that there is a healthcare reform that's captured by a little bit different index that they call the healthcare index. There is an Affordable Care Act that again they, they can do. If you can see, it's different from the economic uncertainty index. Um, they do it for other countries. Uh, so this is Russian uncertainty uncertainty index. Uh, what was big in there. Well, yeah, the terror attacks are not something that you can, you know, easily predict. Uh, Maidan, you see a big, big, immediate big jump. So, I mean, they play a bit with that and they show that, you know, they, they can predict volatility and it's nice to be able to predict volatility. Um, but yeah, they mostly count uh, words. So it's not even something quite sophisticated. The next one I want to show is a very different beast. So it's not about macro, it's not about finance, it's about efficiency of procurement. And what they do in there is, is actually quite interesting. So when you study procurement, sometimes you want to study whether bureaucrats are efficient, okay? And how do you study that? Well, for instance, if you have two bureaucrats and one of them is buying gasoline for you know police cars, two times more cheap, then another bureaucrat, the first bureaucrat is a better bureaucrat than the second bureaucrat. Why? Because if he buys it cheaper for, you know, the state police, there is a huge saving of money, of public money, right? You can use this savings for, you know, making better roads or something. So the problem is, well, when you study gas, right, when you study petrol, there are standards of petrol and you can compare the price of petrol. The problem is petrol is not a lot of observations. The other standardized thing is pharmaceuticals. So like insulin is insulin, you know, it's, it's a very specific thing. You don't get, you know, fancy insulin with, you know, a red cap kind of thing. Uh, but a lot of things that they procure in Russia, right, is not standardized. And when you read the specification of what you're procuring, they are just words, right? And you kind of want to be able to say, this guy in Moscow region bought folders two times cheaper than this guy in St. Petersburg who paid two times more for the same folders. Why are they the same folders, right? So how to make sure that the folder for the Moscow guy is the same as the folder for the St. Petersburg guy? That's what they are doing here. And the way how they do it is pretty ingenious. So they, what they look at is the customs form. And on the customs form, there is a customs classification. So they use the customs declarations, which are not for everything, right? To understand which words in the description of an item match which classifier. So they learn, they make this learned model that, that knows which words correspond to which classifier. 
and then they take descriptions of the procurement announcements in Russia and they classify to the same customs declarations. And now they know it's the same folder. Why? Because it's the same customs classifier and the customs classifier is very, very, very precise. Lena would know better about this paper than I do. If I said something wrong, Lena, please uh, correct me. Okay. I probably it's didn't. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, this paper was made in higher school of economics. So David was visiting higher school of economics for I think a couple of years, and. Yeah, and now he's in uh, George Washington University. I think here there is an acknowledgement, right? And yeah, so basic research program and higher school, uh, National Research University, higher school economics. All right. Um, this year, this gentleman went on the market from Warwick and he got a job in, uh, I want to say, Barcelona. I don't remember for sure, but. Um, he's got a number of papers and this is his job market paper. Um, so what he did in this paper was he took uh, Trump's anti-Muslim tweets and he showed that they cause anti-Muslim violence. Okay, so anti-Muslim violence is a specific uh, kind of crime. So you can get data on anti-Muslim hate crimes from the FBI. But what's an anti-Muslim tweet, right? And that's where the textual analysis came into play. So they classified some tweets that they got from other places as anti-Muslim. And then they took uh, thousands of tweets by Trump and classified them using the classifier. And they got about 296 and they made the regression and they showed that there is a jump uh, whenever Trump makes an anti-Muslim tweet, there is a little bit of, you know, assaults and racial hatred in the United States. More so if there is Twitter coverage. More so if there is more racial prejudice before. Right? So, like, it's not a paper about textual analysis, but it is a paper that uses textual analysis to answer things, such as does writing stuff on Twitter cause violence? Yes, it does, right? So I guess there is about uh, 100 papers, 100 pages in this paper. Um, it's available on CSRN. You guys can take a look at that. Um, yeah, so Miller, Schwartz, uh, I, I don't think it's forthcoming yet, but it's gonna be forthcoming in a year or so. So again, not something terribly complicated. If you look at this guy's website, he's got much more complicated machinery in some other papers, but it's, it's a nicely done, easy enough paper that you know, uses a not so sophisticated technique. All right, and there was one more that I am not sure if I opened it. Um, called, hope I'll find it. Yes, very good. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is a collection of all kinds of people who are taking a number of uh, indices, like I described from uh, the paper of uh, Baker Bloom, and Davis, obviously there were other, you see there is a lot of different indices of uncertainty from all kinds of people. So here's Baker, Bloom and Davis, right? Here is the Tetlock that uses the Harvard four classifier of um, emotion in the text. So they took just a bunch of indices and applied it to the UK and they were predicting stuff and they found different efficiency of different indices. So uh, they are not too much correlated with each other. So they're studying different things. So they are all pretty useful. Uh, 
And I mean, this is the kind of a paper that could be done just by, you know, knowing the literature, right? Which one is working best? Which one is good at uh, bad times? Which one is good at predicting inflation? Which one is good at predicting business investment? Which one is good at predicting GDP, right? Some of them are good at GDP. Some of them are not terribly good. So, yeah. Right, so this is RMSC. Smaller RMSC is better. And some of them don't. So like the IMF is not very good, very predictable from the, from the what's going on in the UK newspapers. Business investment, well, yeah, there's quite a lot of change if you take into account these different indices. All right, so this, this is not even, you know, a paper that, um, can contribute something very new. This is a paper that takes a number of papers and says, well, did we have these different conflicting measures of things? Which one is better, right? And that's, you know, gonna come out of, well, maybe not an AR, but uh, something like, uh, I wanna say Journal of Monetary Economics, but they cannot, obviously promise, promise these things. Right, so people use detection analysis to study all kinds of weird things. In my presentation, I have a list of that. Is there in any way in which we can check the accuracy of the estimation? Um, so these are the names of papers. You can download them and you can look at them and you can see how they check the accuracy of estimation. So obviously they provide confidence intervals. So the last paper, they had this relative mean squared error and you could see that, you know, the mean squared error of prediction based upon this specific measure is statistically significantly different from if you don't control for this specific measure. Um, other people are using something like uh, out of sample uh, predictions and trying to see whether if you don't estimate based upon the whole sample and you try to predict the part of the sample, does that uh, work or not? How good will be the forecasts? Are as we do forecasts using that? Yes, so you get an additional time series where you have something like, you know, something like, uh, um, well, if you knew how sad are people, right? If you had the usual time series and one more time series saying, this is how sad people are, you will just add it as a right-hand side label and then get an additional coefficient. I guess my point is, this is not necessarily something you want to do. The point of my, of my show and tell today was that there are different things, there are different areas of economics where you can use that. So there is stock market, right? There is GDP and inflation prediction. There is a procurement in Russia. There is whether Trump causes violence. Like a lot of stuff can be studied with that. And what I use that for studying is I am studying papers in journals. All right. Yeah. All right, so this is everything I listed, yeah. Right, so usually what people do when they study what is getting published is they use gel codes, keywords, words and titles or abstracts. There is a gentleman called Josh Angrist, whom you might know from the Angrist and Pishkes, uh, mostly harmless econometrics. And what he has in one of his papers is a study of um, whether it changed a lot what people publish in journals. And what he has in there is a textual analysis based upon the title and abstract, right? Okay, and gel codes, people use gel codes to see 
to look at citations. As you probably know, theory gets cited less than empirical papers are getting cited. Um, if you think about, say, what gets cited in fields outside of economics, it's mostly empirical papers that are getting cited outside of economics. Theory papers from economics are not getting cited. Well, besides things like, you know, uh, Kahneman and Tversky or, you know, Nash equilibrium. Uh, so I guess my point is you need to control for something and people were using gel codes. So what we are doing is something a little bit more sophisticated. So what we are doing is we want to extract information about topics of papers from the text of the papers. Okay, how are we going to do that? Okay, so imagine all the economics was about three things. Up. 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 Uh, I'm happy enough with these questions for now because they don't, like they might be forgotten by the end of the by, by the end of the presentation, it's easier to deal with them right now. So this is going to be the probability of seeing the word inflation. And this is one, okay? If all the text of the paper is saying inflation, 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 that point here represents the paper. Let's say this is uh, some like demand, right? And all the papers about connect the inflation and aggregate demand are going to be on that line. And this axis would be estimate. Okay. And that's a one. And that's a one. And that's a one. All right. Now, every paper that uses these three words, right, can be a point. in this triangle, right? Obviously, the real papers are using much more words, say 100,000 words. So instead of a triangle, you'll get a 100,000 dimensional triangle. But, you know, if we compartmentalize it into a two-dimensional graph, well, this is the, you know, kind of a thing. Um, I realize that everything, yeah, so let's say, these are our papers, right? The thing we are using is called the is called the LDA, Latent Dirichlet Allocation. What does it mean? What it means is that the way how I am going to understand the distribution of papers in my triangle is going to be like that. I'm going to say, well, there is a topic one and there is a topic two, right? And they are going to be, one of them is going to be here and one of them is going to be here. And the way I'm going to explain this thing, this paper, is I'm going to, I'm going to take a different color, is I'm going to draw a line and that point here, it's not going to work like that, here is going to be my representation of the paper 
in the space of my topics. Now, I am going to explain it with more words. I have a hundred thousand dimensional measure of which words are using with which frequency in the paper. Okay, I counted all the words, I counted the proportion of frequency of these words, and I know the proportions of different words used in my papers. 100,000 dimensional objects are not very useful. It's hard to use so many dimensions. So instead of 200, instead of 100,000 words, I'm going to use less 200 topics. Okay, and every paper is going to be represented by the how much from topic one and how much from topic two I have in that paper. So instead of remembering this star as a three dimensional object, I am going to remember this star as a two dimensional object as a position between these two hearts. Obviously, in three dimensional triangles it's not a useful exercise but if you have a hundred thousand dimensional triangle going from that into 200 dimensions is saving a lot of effort to everybody right so what do i need to estimate i need to estimate for every paper i need to estimate the topic loadings so i need to estimate how much is coming from topic one and how much is coming from topic two for every my paper that I'm going to study. And I need to say how many words, how many, what was the what is the count of words in this topic and what is the count of words on this topic. So I'm estimating not only the paper loading for each paper and every topic loading for each paper. But I'm also estimating which words come into which topics. I am not telling the computer that this paper is, you know, 60% micro, 20% micro. I'm telling it there are 200 topics. What is the best way to estimate something like that? And the computer spends about a day and it says, well, here is about 200 topics and here is about 7,000 papers from the AER that are classified in this specific way. Now, I am going to show you how I classify papers in that, uh, with that approach. So we have a, an appendix of about 200 pages. We drop five topics which are not really informative. They're mostly technical code kind of thing. And this is the first topic that the machine chose without any of our in intervention. It said, well, there is a lot of words like health, mortal, life, death, AG, rate, height, expect, disease. I, I don't have a way of naming them besides using my own brain and saying that looks very much like health economics. Right, And to check myself, I'm asking the machine, tell me which papers are using the most uh, in the, in the, which papers are using this topic the most. And look, early life health and cognitive function, hate health and cognitive function, aging, longevity, influenza pandemic, social economic status and health health economics right so i don't have a way that would give me like it's health economics is probability black right but a lot of these papers use a lot of this topic and they seem to be very much with health economics and i can look at how many papers were using that what 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 is the proportion of this topic in the whole like corpus of AER? and i can see it's increasing Right, we get much more health economists now compared to what it was in 1980. So this is one of the topics. This is a second topic. 
city, location, area, population, distance, urban, spatial, local, geography. It looks very much like something like urban economics. Highway equals suburbanization, wasteful commuting, right? population in cities. Now that didn't increase much. There was some variation, right? It again, seems like something useful. Work, hour, wage, labor supply, right? Sleep and delegation of time, housework wages and division of housework time, delegation of time over five decades, time used during Great Recession. Same story. But notice how for health economics, there is an increase in time, right? And I calculated the p-value and I mean, it is significant. And for this one, it's pretty much flat, right? And for that one, it's decreasing. What's that? Let's find out. Estimate model equations, variables, coefficients, function parameters, simultaneous equations, right? Semi-parametric estimation of testing theory. So this is this is the econometrics of estimation, and arguably there is less about that in the, in the what's going on now. So now people are mostly going into identification, into into uh, causality, right? So the kind of stuff that you know whether your estimator converges to. Uh, what it's supposed to be converging is not as popular as it used to be. So we do that for every of our 200 topics, right? Trade, trader, market, sell, order, buy, transaction. Survey, respond, question, response, ask, report, individual measure. Reform, China, enterprise, Chinese, Soviet, economic planning, right? It seems to be working. It seems to be getting something. Uh, I wanted to show you this one. So that's the topic 181. If you look at the words, right? It doesn't seem like, like it's something about taxes, right? But then you look at who writes that and all of these papers are French language. So just by looking at words, we would classify that as something about taxation. But looking at the papers, it's clearly not just taxations. It's, it's papers in French in Econometrica. And of course, after Jean-Jacques Lafont and Jean Tirol, there is plenty of uh, French economists who are studying efficient taxation. So that, that could you know, be the reason why there is a lot of taxation involved words in, in, in our tax show notes. So yeah, uh, this is how we classify. So coming back to uh, the whiteboard. So we have about 100,000 dimensional triangle and we have about uh, 7,000 AER articles and uh, about 40,000 40, papers from the rest of the top five. And we classify papers, for each paper we find what is the topic of that paper. And then we look at graphs like that one, right? for every topic at the same time. And we are thinking, okay, so now we know we have a graph for AR like that. And we know that in this year here, we had a new editor whose papers are very much about this topic. Is that a coincidence that when this editor came in, we have this jump in the paper load? And now we are going to estimate that. Any questions so far? Mm 
it seems now we can continue yeah. all right um so we classify words into topics we get the topics for every paper we see how topics change in time some topics appear for instance there is much more um mechanism design now there's much less keynesian analysis now and we see how changes in topics in time correlate with the appointment of the new editor. So we have a new incoming editor, we look at his topics, and we are asking whether the new guy changes everything towards himself. Uh, yeah, so we look at three years before, three years after. So a new person comes in, you look at the topics before, topics after, you look at topics in ER and topics in the rest of the top five, and we look at the topics for the editor, right? So we take a publication like one year, we take a window of four years and we see how it works. So there are different kinds of topics. Some of them are increasing, some of them are decreasing, some of them have trends, some of them. So topics might be a research topic. They might be health economics, right? They might be just words. Maybe before you didn't need to cite Offlin and Straff and Caldor. Maybe now you need to cite uh, so, sorry, um, I don't know what are these topics and it does not matter for me. Why not? Because if, say, there is now more French words in the materials, right, in AR, Okay, we learned something, right? If there is a new editor that forces people to use French words, if there is now better publication chances for people who use French words, we learn something about the whole procedure, right? Maybe it's a research topic. Maybe it's just the way how people speak. That's fine. If we see the change explained by the editor's behavior, we learn something about this paper. And yeah, so this is the paper loading. So here is what we run. We run the topics in AR after the appointment on what is the editor's topics and what is the rest of the top five. And we look at what happened in the rest of the top five and we got the editor's topics and we got AR topics. And we look at the difference between AR and the top five before and after after conditioning on the editor's topics. But the problem with this regression is that editors are not appointed randomly. We don't know why did they appoint this person to this journal, right? They could be appointing the editor because they wanted somebody to work more on introducing French words or introducing uh, um, COVID studies. Victoria, Sergey, do Scopus or WAS use such methodics automatically in order to estimate the popularity of topics? Not as far as I know. They should be, I use the JSTOR data. So the JSTOR provides word counts for the paper. So I didn't read to like read them myself. Somebody else already calculated the words. The nice thing about that is like if you download all the papers from JSTOR, that's actually not necessarily compliant with the license of using papers. Like you can, you, as, an, as a researcher, you can read the papers to learn what's written in them, but I, I'm not sure it's always the case that it's okay to study them. JSTOR is happy with you studying the textual analysis. Uh, topics calculations based on citations. Um, some people studied topics from the perspective of uh, things like uh, keywords or gel codes in economics, but keywords in general. Uh, obviously, if there is a paper that's about COVID and everybody citing that, you can see that the, the COVID goes up. Um, the thing is, um, usually it's hard to, like they do this, you know, word clouds, right? 
usually they just do the work clouds for the pers for the for the enjoyment of using the work clouds right so like the part that you do the textual analysis is a computer science kind of project so the difference of economics from computer science is that you study some resource allocation involved in that and what we are doing is we are looking at whether it increases your chance to publish if you have a, re a, r a right topic when you submit right so other papers like finance papers right they were not like okay we did the textual analysis and we're done no they were looking at whether using the textual analysis is profitable uh, so textual analysis for an economist should not be a final purpose it should be a tool and uh, i need to look at the top topic the scopus topics calculations but my perception of people who were doing that was mostly like they were doing these word clouds and they were like oh look what an interesting word cloud we have in here right um hope that's yeah okay right so if you appoint an editor right uh it could be because those who wanted an editor they wanted the editor to do something to the topic composition right so it's not like for instance right right now in march in february right everybody knows that there will be a lot of COVID papers there is already a bunch of COVID papers in february right in july there will be a new editor in ar the people who are deciding who is the editor of ar might want a person who understands epidemiology to control the onslaught of papers about COVID. Okay, so the fact that a person was working in epidemiology in this case would not be affecting what is getting submitted to ER, but instead it's like trying to predict what's going to be the submissions of AR in the next half a year. This indigeneity, we are trying to deal with a little bit. Here's how. We take the topics before, we take the editor's topics before, and we run the regression of topics before on topics of AR before and topics of the top five before. So how can you explain who is getting appointed based upon the papers that get published? okay if you are taking only people who publish like they do in a ER, this will be one this will be zero if you're only taking people who are not publishing like in a ER, this is zero this is one right so you get the idea and then we are trying to we take this residual that's individual bias right and we are trying to predict what the editor is publishing after the appointment with the noise that there was in the before the appointment. So if somebody likes uh, epidemiology very much, the vector of topics would have a big positive value for epidemiology and a lot of negatives for other topics. And then I'm explaining what he's working on during the appointment with the deviations okay and this instrumentalized topics right is what we are going to use as a factor when we are explaining what happens to the topics in different journals in different times all right okay so yeah this is just AR topics curing, right? So we get an editor and AR seem to be moved towards the editor's preferences. Doesn't seem to be moving too much against the rest of the top five. And the difference is clearly positive, All right? But if you instrument if you instrument, the effect is a bit different, right? 
when you instrument, when you take only the noise that was not explained by the first stage of who is getting appointed, you suddenly get well, pretty much the same value for AR, but a stronger effect away from the top five. So the difference is actually much bigger. It's not terribly big, right? But uh, it's like two words in a hundred words or two papers in a hundred papers. I mean, it's big enough. If you think about the impact of a top five publication on the career of the researcher, right? It's two people who got tenure and two people who didn't get tenure. Yeah. But yeah, then we play with robustness checks. We look at 100 topics. We look at 300 topics. We look at gel codes. We look at uh, whether keeping just the editors who were not the editors in the rest of the top five makes sense. Um, we look at the optimal quantity of topics. And it seems that 2,000 topics is still increasing the likelihood. So I guess my point is, it seems to be a robust finding. There is like a little bit of move towards the editor even after you instrumentalize for that. The paper is gonna be greatly rewritten in the next couple of months. Hopefully it will end up in where it has revised us a bit now, but I hope that was interesting for the listeners and if you've got questions i am happy to answer them we still have about what 10 minutes for questions lena yeah i was so quick in searching the mic <laughs> okay yes i have 10 minutes uh, for discussion questions comments suggestions Right. Um, the biggest problem for us is that we don't know which editor handles which paper. So we don't know who is the editor in charge for each paper and we don't know the papers that got rejected. Like don't interpret it as the new editor is changing something. No. First of all, we don't know who is editing what. Second is that you you don't interpret it as a bias. Why? Um, imagine you, well, yeah. Uh, let me finish about the bias and I'll answer about the software. Imagine you have a, a probability that the paper will get published in AR. The acceptance rate in AR is Four percent. Okay. Now think about the proportion of good papers in the sample of papers submitted to ER. Unless it's equal to four percent, an appointment of the editor who knows everything will change the proportion of accepted paper to from four percent to whatever is the proportion of good papers in the sample. So it can go higher, it can go lower, depending upon um, depending upon how many good papers are there in the population. It just it doesn't have to stay in the same place. And it doesn't have to represent a bias. It just represents better understanding of the papers. Is there any software that is normally used for textual analysis? So uh, long story short, yes. A longer answer is, let me make a new share for that. Uh, so there is a mallet, what I'm using. No, that's not what I'm using. Uh, mallet is from uh, mallet textual analysis. Right. So this is uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. So they made this big thing that told, uses what Latin directly analysis is, is what I'm using. There is other stuff that it can do. There are tutorials, downloads, everything is free. If you want to do textual analysis, you want to invest into Python skills. 
So Python is very good at downloading a lot of standardized data sets and at uh, operating with them. Uh, Carlo Schwartz, so that's the gentleman I mentioned. Uh, Carlo Schwartz wrote a command, this LDA Gibbs for Stata that you can use to analyze your textual analysis. Okay, um, that might be useful as well, but this, this is the classifier. This is not really a classifier, but yeah. I guess my point is uh, there are standardized software packages in computer science. In economics, I don't think there is like one thing, but uh, since applied economists are invested a lot in Python, there are definitely Python packages. So my co-author who is dealing with our paper is really in Mallet for textual analysis, for, for, for Latin Dirichlet analysis and uses Python for all the, you know, cleaning, stemming. Um, when you have the word economics, economy, economist, you just keep the stem, econom, so that, that stemming procedure is in Python. Um, there is something called the, the tokens. So if you do sovereign default, right, you want this to be one word, right? You don't want it to be a word sovereign and a word default, you want them to be together. So that thing is in Python as well. Is this quite related to sentimental analysis? Yes and no. It's not the only thing you can use for the sentiment analysis, but uh, the paper by Tetlock is pretty much using it for the sentiment analysis. Uh, essentially, you kind of want to guess what the people mean. And uh, that's one of the ways uh, you can directly ask people, right? So I mentioned a friend of mine using a smiley faces and frowny faces in Twitter. So in there you can, you don't really need to guess what that means, but uh, yeah, so you can use it for the sentimental analysis. I have the same question about the software. Um, mallet. And that thing in Stata seems to be working quite well. There are all kinds of the other approaches. Do you have to upload the paper in the software? Um, I use just the word counts. If you go to JSTOR textual analysis, uh, ba, 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 ba. Right. Left. There you go. I mean, so the JSTOR gave us data as the list of the words. So it is not exactly uploading the papers. You kind of we can like it saved us a step because we would need first to count the words in the paper. So they counted the words for us, which was very nice of them. But uh, yeah, so you, we use the texts. Other people are using abstracts. Abstracts are easier to get. There is something called the econ lit where you can get just the abstracts from much more uh, journals than just the journals in JSTOR. But, uh, in abstract, you get what, 100 words. In the text, you get, you know, 10,000, 20,000 words. So you get much more things to worry about. And our paper is different from many other papers because it uses the whole paper text count. And we know a lot of papers that are using just the abstract. So they usually use the abstract, the title, and the keywords. And our paper uses everything. All right. Um, I need to remember what was the what was the JSTOR's place where I was getting data from. There was there was a name for that. 
JSTOR Creator Data. And... No, I don't remember anymore. Point being, there was a, like a separate domain on JSTOR that was just about giving people data to do data analysis on. Uh, yeah, it's not straightforward, maybe here. Yeah, no. Okay, cool. More questions? No questions? Well, okay then, thank you very much for coming. Uh, let's close it, maybe then officially.